Welcome everybody. So we've got sophomores. How many sophomores in the room? A few of you folks. Good. You're right on time. You're not early, by the way. You're on time. Um, juniors, any freshmen in the room? Okay, good. Any seniors? I always get nervous when I have, we've got one senior over here. Awesome. Good. You're at the right place. Love it. Uh, well, my name is Dale, uh, and I'm the owner and founder of Access College America. We are here in Austin. We are the highest rated college planning agency in the region. We have some specialties uh, that include STEM. Most of the families we're working with are applying to STEM majors, which include pre-med, business, computer science, engineering, nursing programs. Um, we also start working with incoming freshmen, and we work with all of our families and all of our scholars to help get their college applications submitted by September the 1st, going into their senior year. Um, so by September the 1st, going into the senior year so that we can make a pivot and we start helping everybody with their scholarship and honors applications. And by the way, hello everybody online. Um, thank you for joining us too. So you guys also get to take notes as well. Um, before I get started in essays, um, I want to talk just briefly a little bit about the status of college admissions. I know some of you guys have heard me speak before. Let's keep this informal. It's a Sunday morning. I've had like one or two cups of coffee. That's it. My little girl's been up since 4.30 this morning. Um, so I'm going to keep it very informal. I don't like stuffy presentations. So if you have questions, ask me. Uh, but I do want to give you a brief update on how things are going. What we're noticing in the grand scheme of college admissions is that the most popular colleges are only becoming more popular. Um, you know, colleges and universities are experiencing what's called application inflation. You know, uh, we were just talking about Tennessee a minute ago, not necessarily the University of Tennessee, but the University of Tennessee did receive a 40% increase in one year from uh, applications. Uh, and a majority of those applications actually came from the state of Texas. Texas, uh, as a state, uh, students here actually uh, apply uh, to more colleges out of state. It's one of the busiest uh, states. It's overrepresented in the applicant pool. A lot of folks are wanting to get out of town for some reason. Hi, we're almost done. Just kidding. <laughs> um, so these big state flagships are experiencing application inflation. Um, and, you know, when you think about that, I think one of the reasons why universities across the board are receiving uh, the more selective schools are, you know, releasing record volume or record number, number uh, uh, low acceptance rates. It's because they're not actually um, adding chairs to the classroom. You know, they're still admitting the same number of students. If you look over the last few years, I talked to you about UT a lot because almost everybody we work with has got UT on the list. Um, you know, it's been pretty consistent. They've admitted around 18,000 um, students for the last several years. They've got around 48 percent um, uh, uh, yield rate. And so they normally have around 9,000, 9,500 students. Uh, for their incoming class. That number hasn't really changed. The only change in all of this is that the volume of applications has gone up. This past year, 66,000 applications for 18,000 seats. And so what that means is the more applications a university receives, the lower the acceptance rates. I think a lot of reasons why colleges and universities are receiving record volume numbers of applications. Well, we have a perfect storm happening. Um, now everybody with straight A's thinks they can get into a school like UT because they don't have to submit their test score. And so this is really revving up um, those application totals. So now that everything is test optional, more students are applying to more colleges than ever before. Um, also, you know, technology. A lot of these colleges are on what's called the common application. And so, you know, with a very easy click of the button, you can apply to a handful of colleges. And you know, parents back in the day when we went to school, I didn't apply to any school I wasn't sincere about because I had to call the university, get a paper application, and write that baby. I wasn't doing that to any school that I wasn't really serious about. 
And students are literally copying and pasting the exact same essays, changing the name of a university, and firing it off to a lot of colleges, which I'll talk about that. So technology is helping students apply to more colleges. Testoptional has really um, misrepresented the likelihood of a student getting admitted into a university. If you apply test optional, especially to a STEM major, that's a challenge. These colleges and universities want those test scores. And it's important you understand what a good test score is for you. I think the third reason why there's so many more applications it's because of social pressure to get into specific universities. Yes. So I had a question about that. Uh, you said college and universities uh, want test scores. So like in the event that you didn't necessarily do as well as you thought, would you still submit just to show that you put in some effort? No. Um, good question. And you, this is a university by university uh, question. So you want to look at the unit. His question is, do I still submit the test scores so that the university knows I at least tried? Not necessarily. Um, and so you want to look at what the what is the major you're going to consider applying into. What is a competitive score for that university? And there's there's a little bit of science behind um, knowing when to submit a score and when not to. So I've got a presentation on that called College Planning 101. You can definitely attend that. I go into that. But back to the social pressure. You know, the students, especially at Westlake, you know, they're applying to the exact same colleges, UT, a and I love it when someone says UT or a and is my backup school. It's a safety school. Uh, it's not really a safety for anybody these days. Um, you know, Clemson, UGA, Chapel Hill. I mean, there's like this short list of colleges that everybody's applying to. And students are, are, are really um, attaching the social value of who they are to the same short list of colleges and they're crowdsourcing their way through this. And parents are telling the kids, what's a good school? And, you know, I think you'll get in because you've got a, you know, a 4.0 and you've got a good test score. And everything has changed in the landscape of college admissions, especially when you're applying to STEM majors. So my pro tip, if you're watching this, is to have a balanced college list. Six to eight schools with safeties, targets, and reaches. And if you're applying to a university that has you know, single digit acceptance rates, that is not a reach. That is considered an extreme reach, all right? Extreme reach. So you can actually have a fourth tier. And fall in love with all the colleges on your list not just the reaches and extreme reaches. You need to be just as excited about the safeties and the targets. Moms and dads out there, don't drag your kid on a college visit tour all the way through the east, northeast, and go take them and see Tufts and you know Boston and MIT and Chapel Hill and Columbia. Those schools don't need to be sold. You need to make sure if you're going to go and visit colleges and universities, okay, visit some of these schools, but also Visit the safety schools. Go take a look at the University of Pittsburgh. Amazing school. Go look at you know, some other colleges where they're statistically likely to get admitted into. So if you're gonna go and do college visits, the sophomore and the junior year, bless you, make sure that the colleges that you're gonna to go tour, that it's a mix of schools, safeties and targets and reaches, not just the reaches and extreme reaches because those schools speak for themselves. All right. So let's go ahead and get started with essay prep. Okay. You, you guys. Okay. Awesome. Um, what is it that you guys want to make sure that you learn in this presentation today about the essays? I'm going to just roll through it then. All right, because I know that y'all all probably have the same questions, but nobody wants to ask the first one. That's okay. No, I get it. And it's Sunday morning. All right. Um, there's really four pieces of writing that you're going to have for your college applications. All of the information I'm going to give you is relevant for freshmen, sophomores, and of course, juniors and seniors in the back over here, too. Um, but this is really important because I think that so many families assume or so many high school students, teens really freak out about the main essay. And yes, that tends to be the area that is the hardest in the college application, but y'all got a lot more things to worry about than just the main essay. There's four pieces of writing. You have the main essay, 
You have the common application activity list. You have the expanded resume if you're applying to the University of Texas. And the fourth and final piece of writing that you're going to have are your short answer questions. The main essay, your common application activity list, your expanded resume for the University of Texas, and also your short answer questions. I'm going to go through all of this here in just a moment. I'll go through each of these components. Please ask me questions. It'll give me a chance to take a breath. <laughs> Two. Yes, ma'am. You said there's five pieces of writing, but you listed four. Four pieces of writing. Four, four pieces, pieces of, writing. of writing. Correct, correct. Four pieces of writing. Now, um, the first thing to do in all of this writing is to start doing your research now. I just posted a Facebook Live. By the way, if you use Facebook or Instagram, or if you're on LinkedIn, make sure that you follow Access College America. I post reminders, timelines, registration reminders, tips. I just did a Facebook Live this morning. So make sure that you follow us because I am posting really cool tips on that. But the first thing you need to do in order to prepare for your essays is to get started with the research. It will be incredibly hard to apply to a university, especially a university that's competitive, if you don't know why you're applying to that school. The only thing you have to say is that you heard it was a good school and it's on a short list of rankings. You know, students, and I say this all the time, but where you apply to college, it's probably going to be one of your first real adult decision. And that can be so scary. That's daunting. There's a lot of mystery around college admissions. And moms and dads out there, where you send your baby to college will be one of the most precious, most expensive gifts you ever give them. You deserve to vet this out. You can, nobody would buy a home based off of a neighborhood and opportunities in that home that they heard was great. Everybody walks through the home, you spend time at that home, you drive at daytime, you drive at night, you do your research in the neighborhood and the schools and all that kind of stuff. And way too many high school students and parents are picking colleges and universities without knowing why. And the first year dropout rate is 50%. 50% of students drop out of college their first year. It's not because they say the school's hard. It's not because they say they, you know, that, you know, they couldn't get the classes they wanted. They drop out because they say they feel like they just don't fit in. All right. Shopping for a university is a completely different experience when you go and you spend time at that university. When you look at it online, everybody's happy. Everybody's passing. The weather's beautiful. It's different when you go there and spend time there. But back to my original point, you need to start creating content that you're going to reference in your college applications. All right. You probably can tell I'm type A. I like to win. I'm ultra competitive. You all are in a competition amongst the rest of your peers to get one of those few precious seats at that university. And so we Think about writing and working and creating, you know, your essays and all of that. You need to have material that you can reference in your college application. I'll talk about that, obviously, um, a lot deeper. But if you haven't started touring colleges and universities and you're not getting organized, now's the time to do it. Um, what I like to do in terms of my timeline, this is only when I get a few deer and headlight looks, so just bear with me. But you, if you're planning on getting a balance, if you are planning on applying to a balanced list of six to eight schools, and the biggest mistake, the most common mistake the students make is they apply to a list of like seven or eight reach schools and one safety school that they're not excited about. They work their tail off all through high school and they feel like they're a failure because they only got into their one, you know, a safety school that they're not excited about. Don't do that to yourself, by the way. You deserve to have multiple options that you're excited about in the spring of your senior year. But um, if you're applying to a balanced college list of six to eight schools, you should have toured those colleges. And I'm going to tell you now, you're not going to hit a home run. You're not going to fall in love with every single school you go and visit. I had somebody recently that wanted to apply to the, uh, uh, what was it? Was it the School of Mines? I think it was the university. I think it was CU Boulder. She wanted to apply to CU Boulder and she wanted to do athletics at Boulder. And 
I kept telling her, you need to go and visit. You need to go and visit. It's a safety school. I know I'm getting in. I don't, I don't need to go and visit. And I kept telling the mom they need to go and visit. They didn't want to go and visit because the mom was going to have to book airfare, hotel, lodging. And, you know, the daughter's like, well, we already know I'm going to get in. I'll go tour it, you know, once I've been admitted into the school, which happens a lot with families. Oh, I'll tour the safeties after I'm admitted if I don't get admitted into my reaches. Well, throughout more of the research, the daughter realized she actually fell in love with Boulder. You know, this school that she started researching quickly became one of the front runners on her list. And she realized, I think I'm going to go to Boulder once I get admitted. And this, this college list will change. You know, what your number one dream school is, may, you know, through research and all this kind of stuff, it may change those rankings <laughs> of, of your own personal list. Well, you know, I think it was like months and months later, finally the mom listened to me and booked a tour and went to go visit. I think she was a junior or something. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, went to go a, a Saturday pre, uh, preview day. Goes, and I remember the phone call. It was first thing on a Saturday morning, the mom called me up. And I was like, this is weird. The tour starts at 10 a.m. It's 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Why is she calling me? Um, and she was like, you're never going to believe this. We're sitting in the car outside of the, outside of the preview day, and my daughter is bawling her eyes out. She's having a massive panic attack. Doesn't want to go in, doesn't want to see any more of the facilities, realize she doesn't like the snow, doesn't want to go to school in it. She said the buildings are old, it's too big, it feels overwhelming, and she knows right now she doesn't want to go to school here. Now, she would have gone to Boulder. She would, this was a school that she had learned about, knew all about, was like, oh, I'm going to go. I know this is a school I want to go to. But because of her experience going and touring that university, realized this isn't for me. So you deserve the exact same experience to vet out these colleges. If you're going to apply to a list of six to eight schools, my advice is to tour 12 to 15, tour 12 to 15 colleges. And you can't do this all in one year, that would be crazy. Um, so you wanna kind of break it up a little bit. Maybe you wanna to tour two or three schools in the fall of your sophomore year, two or three schools in the spring of your sophomore year, two or three schools in the fall of your junior year, you get the point, and that's how you get to the map. And that, and after you've toured 12 to 15 colleges, you will have a good gut feeling on six to eight schools that are really good for you. The most underestimated variable in college list building. It's not the numbers. Parents can do that. You can run the numbers. You know how much this college is going to cost. It's not the academics. You can look at the colleges and universities. You all look at rankings, which are all bogus. But you know what's considered a good school in your, you know, in your mind. But it's the social experience. Students drop out because they say they feel like they just don't fit in. And that's the, what, that is the area that students don't spend the most time on really getting an idea to try on this university. If you don't have a tribe, you don't have a home, you're not going to succeed. You're going to have a hard time. Now, when you're researching colleges, and this is going back into the Essex, um, and if you text me and I have a number, uh, I'll give you, I'll send you what's called my College Connect form. I'll give you this number in a moment. Um, when you're researching colleges and universities, you can use this College Connect form. And make sure that somebody reminds me so I can give you this number. Um, you want to make sure that you're, before you go and visit a university, that you've actually done your diligence online. You've learned about the faculty members, the labs, the majors. Um, if you don't know what you wanted to study, I think the gentleman left a minute ago, UT has a really great um, career exploration um, tool called My Majors that you can take. Um, but if you don't know what you want to study, you want to start thinking about that now. Um, but when you go and tour a university, you're looking for content that you couldn't find online. You're looking to learn about faculty members, a lab, a facility, a tool, a piece of technology. Anybody in here interested in studying computer science? Engineering? No? That's a first. Normally, I've got at least one for or something. Nobody wants to put their hands up. Okay, so um, anyway, computer science, you know, there's opportunities to, you know, you know, it's like being a doctor, you know, you're, you're not, you're going to be, you know, if you want to be, you know, go the pre-med route, there's different specialties, same thing with computer science, you have firmware, software, uh, AI, cybersecurity, 
when you're touring colleges and universities, let's say that you really want to do cybersecurity, you want to look at those opportunities for research and start comparing opportunities for cybersecurity at UTSA versus the research opportunities at UT Dallas, so to speak. So this is where you're getting more into, you know, the, the very, very um, high level differences of, you know, what makes these colleges unique. You know, yes, you're going to study computer science, but what is the difference between, you know, cybersecurity at this school versus this other school? And so as you're collecting that research, all right, now you're laying down the foundation so that you're not going to be stuck staring at a white screen uh, working on these essays. All right, so everyone's with me so far. Research, research, research. Very, very, very important. The other thing you have to realize is if you do not know what you want to study, if you have no clue, that should also influence your college list. A lot of people apply to UT and they don't know what they want to study. That is not a good idea because you do not apply to UT. You have to pick a major and your entire application will be filtered through the lens of that major. You have to have experience in that major. This is true for a lot of the Ivies, the most elective colleges in America, like Chapel Hill, the UCs. A lot of colleges have what's called a holistic review, where you pick a major and everything that you have done since the summer going into your freshman year will be evaluated. A lot of folks, when they call us, they're like, oh, I'm early, my kid's only a freshman. No, everything your kid does right now, including how they spend their summers, will be pulled apart. The transcripts, uh, how they spend their summers, research opportunities, clubs, organizations. Admissions officers are looking at all four years of the high school experience. They're not just looking at the junior year. So think about this, you know, when you're applying to a university and when you're declaring a major, how that will impact the review process. Now, let's move into the main essay. Hmm. I'll go ahead and give you guys that. Well, I'll give you guys a, a, a number in a moment. I'm going to make sure I give you that form. All right. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about college list building because it's going to be really hard to work on essay prep when you don't know what colleges you're going to apply to. We've talked a lot about how to collect research. It's going to be really hard to work on all four of these essays if you don't have any information about the college you're applying to. So college list building, research, um, now the essays. Your prompts for the main essays, if you're a class of 24, current junior class, those prompts have been released, folks. And those prompts tend to get released around late February or March, if you're applying using the common application, the common application, which is probably what everyone's going to use here. You can actually go ahead and start your common application and create your profile now. Now, you can't apply to any colleges. Um, your college applications will go live on August the 1st. So you can create your profile now, and all that information will roll over on August the 1st, which I do recommend that you go ahead and do that now. So the common application is what they'll use. Those prompts will there'll be seven prompts that you can select from. And I've got a secret for you. The admissions officers do not care which of these prompts that you, uh, you use. There's not a favorite prompt. And you don't have to have a tragedy that happened in life, um, you know, to write about for your main essay, all right? You can pick a very ordinary topic and make it sound extraordinary, which this is going to sound really cliche and cheeky, but I believe it. You all are extraordinary in your own rights. Your job is to highlight your strength and tell your story. Nobody else is like you. And I firmly believe that too, by the way. So your main essay prompts, if you're juniors, have already been released. There's seven of them. The main essay will be the hardest part of the entire application. That's what everybody pushes the panic button on. And what and the problem is most everybody is waiting until August, maybe September to actually get started on that. Don't do that to yourself. Nobody likes a high pressure cooker experience where you have to work on one main essay draft and you don't have time to really let that marinate and you've got to apply overnight. We recommend getting started, or we as an agency are working already with our cheaters on the main essay. Most of our folks have draft two, maybe three done by now because you want to give that some time. So I'll go with a little bit into uh, 
practical tips. But if you're working on a timeline, we like to have the main essay done by July the 1st. July the 1st, we like that main essay done. It's going to change, by the way. What a lot of high school students do is they work on that main essay draft and they come back to it. And you want that main essay to kind of marinate a little bit. You want to make sure that you have weeks and weeks and weeks to really think about this. So that's why we like getting started on the main essay by May 1st and have it done by July the 1st. And then once you submit your applications, it will have had time to, you will have had time to go back and make any changes. Now that main essay, let me explain to you the intention of the main essay. The admissions officer, by the time they get to the main essay, they know a lot about you. They know what high school you came from, your GPA, your class rank, all universities are going to rank you. They will um, have an idea, obviously they'll know what major you're wanting to apply to. They'll know what zip code you're in, so they'll know what access to resources you have. They'll see your race, which race will factor in college admissions. Um, admissions is not fair. It was never intended to be fair. There's bias in admissions, and admissions decisions are made contextually, individually, holistically, circumstantially. Universities have institutional priorities. So there's a lot of variables that are going into play here. Um, but back to my original point, um, the admissions officer will know the you know, the family income situation. They'll know, um, did you, are you first gen? Are you in your family to go to college? Or, you know, um, what is education level of your parents? That sort of thing. Um, also, they'll see your test scores if you submitted them. At this point, you're a bunch of data points, all right? They're, they're stats on paper. If you're lucky enough to get the second read, the intention of the main essay is to humanize your college application. It is to provide something to the Office of Admissions that they cannot find out any, uh, anywhere else in your application. It's around 650 words. Now, the, um, when the admissions officer reads your main essay, it's important they really feel like they get you once they're done reading that. They understand the psychology of who you are as a human being. They understand how your mind works, your influences, what's um, matter to you. And it's important that you're referencing something that has happened or taken place in high school. All right. So if you want to be an engineer, don't talk about building Legos um, as a kid. That's one thing a lot of engineers love to do. They love to talk about Legos. Um, so, you know, and there's a few common topics you want to steer clear from. Study abroad, very common. You know, mission trips, very common. Fortunately, divorce, very common. Uh, injuries, that wasn't really serious, um, common also. Um, you know, so there's a lot of common topics you want to kind of stay clear from. So the main essay is really about you. Um, it is where you are sharing to the admissions officer how you think. Um, what it, you know, how the world has shaped who you are. All right. This is really, really, really hard for a high school student to do because high school, we're trained that you read a prompt, you answer the question, and there's a right or a wrong response. It's black or white. And that is not how this essay is intended. All right. I always say when you're working on the main essay, you want to ask yourself the essay test. These three questions. First of all, is the topic of this essay, is it popping up somewhere else in the college application? Am I writing about a sport, by the way, if I'm an athlete? Or am I writing about robotics if I want to go into engineering? Am I writing about, um, you know, a business if I want to go into business, but it's on my activity list? You know, is this something else anywhere else? If the answer is no, proceed. Question number two. Is this story unique to me or is this a shared experience? Meaning, can I take my name off of it and put somebody else's name? Now you understand why bishop trips are overused, study abroad trips are overused, injuries, divorce. Unfortunately, these are circumstances that are shared. The person reading your college application is going to read 40, 50, 60 plus applications in a day. Don't become a wallflower with this thing. And then the third question is, can I wrap this story up in two or three sentences? Meaning, 
Are you just kind of giving me everything? I mean, does this kind of go on and on? You're reciting your entire resume here. It's, you know, it's that whole, but wait, there's more, you know, kind of thing here. Um, you know, make it easy for the admissions officer to read. Stick to one topic, maybe two max. No long paragraphs. Have you ever read a newspaper? Many, many short little paragraphs, all right? Keep their attention, all right? So stick to one or two topics, and you can pick a very ordinary circumstance to make it sound extraordinary. Any questions about the main essay before I move on? So timing on that, you said prompts come out in February, you start to think about it, and then you were mentioning like many things in July. So college, up, some colleges, university. If you're following this, um, if you're following this this timeline, many you know, some universities they have their applications open up as early as July the first. And it used to be one of them, by the way. Now they're eight one, and the intel. For, for those of you that came in after that conversation, some universities have what's called rolling admissions. They read applications as they come in. And so, especially if you're applying to a STEM major, which would be business included, you want to make sure that you're applying sooner than later. I always recommend getting that application submitted within the first month if a university has what's called rolling admissions. AM has it too. Um, so, September the 1st for sure for them. Um, ASU, the gentleman, we had a gentleman in the back that was interested in applying to ASU. There were no short answer questions last year to ASU. There's a lot of colleges that don't have short answer questions. Arkansas is another one of them that tends to be pretty popular. So the moment you have your main essay completed by July the 1st, if you're following this, and if you have your activity list done, you can get that college application submitted. All right. And for a lot of colleges, they have a quick turnaround within two or three weeks. Some schools, 48 hours, you can get a decision in 48 hours. Now, there's a little bit of psychology, a mind game that goes into here. You want to make sure that your balanced college list has at least one safety school that is rolling admissions. Here's why. You're not going to have to sweat bullets until the spring of your senior year to find out if you're going to get into college or not. It's a long wait, by the way. So if you can get that early win, Go into your senior year, you've already got an offer in your back pocket, your level of confidence is going to completely change. Because you know that you're going to go to college, you've already got an early win. So there's a little bit of strategy here. I'm going to go into the activity list, but let me answer your question. Yeah, the main essay, you, I did it at the beginning, beginning of July, or sometime in July, and then the short answers. So, so um, by July the 1st, I actually like to have three things finished. I like to have the main essay completed. I like to have the common application activity list completed. These are things that you don't have to wait on. And third, your expanded resume. I like to have these three things done because you're not waiting for a college application to open up to get started and get to work on this. Your short answer questions, you do have to wait to find out what those questions are going to be. You have to wait until the university opens up those questions. But you can predict what those questions will probably be. Most colleges that have short answer questions um, are going to ask you about a leadership experience, why you want to go into this major, um, why you want to go to this university. So you can kind of do some generic drafting a little bit on that so that when those applications go live on 8-1, this is how you get your application submitted by September the 1st. You're pretty much almost done anyway with everything by the time your applications go live. Now, the, yes, ma'am. Can I, so I'm a little bit confused because I understood from what you were saying that when you're writing your main essay, you're trying to not hit topics that are gonna to come in your short answers yes. question. But if you don't know what those short answer questions are, how do you know what you should include in your main essay and what you're gonna put in the short? Answer? Right, right. Well, this goes, one thing I have not spoken about just yet is called layering your college application. One of the first things that we do in our agency is we get started with your expanded resume if you're applying to UT, I'll explain what that is, or definitely you wanna get a resume started. And you want to be intentional with layering your application with evidence of your experience as it applies directly to the major you're applying to. You do not want to duplicate any topics. So really one of the best places to start before you even start writing is by creating that resume. All right, which by the way, admissions officers aren't going to read it anyway. 
anyway, they will read the expanded resume to the University of Texas. And you can send the resume into most schools, but they just don't have time to read things often. But when you create that resume, now you have everything on paper and you can be intentional with how you're going to layer your application. What most students do is they hammer home one or two activities and they drill it into all components of their college application. And the admissions officer is getting bored because they keep seeing the same thing pop up everywhere they're looking and they move on. When you're layering your application, you're giving the admissions officer to learn dimensions about you, something new and fresh every time they turn the page. You're giving them meat to make their mouth water as, and you're providing evidence of that fit to that major. So you wanna get strategic with mapping out what topics you're gonna to use for what particular prompts. Okay, yes. Um, you said it's my story unit. Uh, are you suggesting that in our main essay in those four or five sentences, uh, are, are they have to be a genuine? Yes. So our question is. And uh, is it an advantage to address if uh, our uh, student picked the major? Is it the advantage to address that uh, major in those four no. or five sentences? No. So the main essay, to be clear, is around 650 words. Every single university is going to read this. You do not need to discuss, and I'm so glad she asked this, a lot of high school students will do it. They'll discuss their major in the main essay. There'll be opportunities in the short answer questions to talk about that. The only time that I recommend talking about your major in the main essay, follow me here, this is a little technical. If you're applying to a university that does not have short answer questions, and you're applying to a STEM major, particularly engineering, and you're applying to an honors program, you want to be able to, again, layer your application and provide some level of insight into your curiosity towards that major. Sometimes we do recommend writing two main essays, just so that you have an opportunity to provide evidence and reflection and experience as it applies to your first choice major. Texas State, they don't have short answer questions. And so when you're applying to any honors programs, um, at least they didn't, they haven't years past, but just have one now. But anyway, back to my original point, when you're applying to honors programs, scholarships, things like that, if there's nowhere else for you to talk about how you tinker around with computers, how you're building, you know, research projects, things like that, it may be a good idea to have a main essay in which you are talking about why you want to go to that major. Okay. Uh, but before you all run off and think, oh my God, I got to write two main essays, don't do that to yourself. Don't worry about that. That's, I don't even really like to go into all of that because we're just trying to get through one main essay. All right, so the common application activity list. This is not as popular as the main essay. Not a lot of people know about this, but it is very, very important because every single university you apply to will also read the common application activity list, right? Now, Y'all heard me say a moment ago that your resume is not going to get reviewed by admissions officers. Very few colleges will read that. Some liberal art colleges, the expanded resume, yes, for the University of Texas, but the resume is not required for college admissions. And most admissions officers, as I say, don't have time to read anything extra. You're going to get six, seven, maybe eight minutes with them on a good day. So the common application activity list is where you'll list 10 things that up to 10 things that you did in high school. There'll be a space for, you know, what the position was, what your title, your description. You have 150 characters to work on these descriptions. The way that you rank and order your activities matter. The way that you write your descriptions matter. I actually have a free common application activity list guide on my, on my website in which you can list out all the activities and assign a point value and objectively decide what item should be first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Your common application activity list, as I said, just like with the main essay, every single university is gonna read that. Your common application activity list is the replacement for your resume. It's a digital resume. It isn't a template the admissions officer's eyes is trained to read. Resumes come in all shapes and sizes and they have unicorns and pictures on them. 
Some are two, three, four, five pages, and no one got time to read all that. The activity list, organized, formatted, the admissions officer's eyes can just keep on scanning. You understand? You do not want to blow this off. Nobody would blow off their resume. Most high school students have no clue what this is, and they write one or two things, and they move on to the next item. Every single opportunity you have to highlight your strengths and tell your story, you're in a competition, take advantage of that. So um, the activity list up to 10 things that you did in high school and the way that you rank, order, and write your descriptions are important. On our website, accesscollegeamerica.org, free template. Use it, all right? Um, and you actually can write down those activities and assign a numerical value and realize what should be, because you don't have to list the activities in chronological order, most recent to last. You can list something you did your freshman year or your sophomore year, you can list that first, okay? And you don't have to list the activities as it relates to your major. This is the big difference between the activity list and the expanded resume. So let me move on to the expanded resume. Yes. And I brother you again. Yes. So how do you choose to rank? What do you think is pertinent in the way? Is it where you spend the most time? Is it? Good question. So the currency in college admissions is time. It's time. It's how long have you spent at this activity? So there's different, there's a metric that we use. Does it, how, what is your level of leadership in this activity? How many hours, how many weeks, how many months did you spend in this activity? Um, was this activity directly related to your major? All right, so there's a difference. There's a list of questions that we'll ask and you'll get points based off of those uh, questions and then you'll be able to assign a numerical value. You often will be very surprised at what your first, second, third, and fourth activity should be. Okay, you do need to quantify those activities, by the way, on your activity list. You'll have to provide some type of an estimate how many weeks, how many years, whatever, you did these activities. But a lot of folks like to use what they did most recent or what they feel they're most proud of in high school. And while that's not necessarily wrong, there's a much better way to be competitive with that activity list to make the biggest impact. Keep in mind, especially for STEM majors, your entire application is being viewed through the lens of that major. And so, if the admissions officer doesn't take the time to read all of your activity list, what they did read made the biggest punch. All right, so the expanded resume, all right? Unlike the main essay and the common application activity list, the expanded resume is not gonna be reviewed by every single university. It's generally a three to five page catalog. Don't send this to any other college because they're gonna think you're crazy, all right? a five-page resume and you're only a senior in high school all right mm -hmm. five or six and i've seen them i had somebody once give me an eight-page expanded resume that actually was really good stuff i was like oh my god like what the heck who are you like it was it was good we had to shave that down a little bit um so the expanded resume is not even a resume every single thing that you have done starting from the summer, going into your freshman year of high school, will be part of this, all right? The way that you rank and order and write those descriptions, very, very important, like the activity list. Does not need to be in chronological order. Everything must be quantified. Everything must be quantified. Um, your descriptions got to have action verbs, you know? Created, founded, organized, managed, spearhead, led. And I do recommend uh, creating, uh, listing first the activities as they directly relate to your first choice major and then working down. So let's say that you want to apply to business and you wrote a business plan and you also shadowed a realtor and you had your own lawn care service. But, you know, you also spent, um, most recently, you attended a camp, you know, through your church, and you also um, did some tutoring at Mathnasium, whatever. You wouldn't list Mathnasium and the church 
um, camp experience first. It has nothing to do, and that's, unless you write a description as such, and we could definitely work on that, but you wouldn't list that first. It has nothing to do with getting into business, marketing, finance, these sorts of things. But wait, the business plan and the standing company, you did that two years ago. That's okay. It's, direct, it's directly related to what you want to study. You would list that first, right? So the way that you list your activities, start from the very top, working down, the activities that are not related to what you want to do definitely go last. Um, on our website, we have an expanded resume template totally free. I have a ton of free stuff on my website. If some of y'all haven't been there before, check it out. We actually have a free webinar series happening right now. So download the activity list template, download the expanded resume template, and then we have a free college planning webinar series in which we talk about testing, you know, college list building, all this. Let me give you the number. So take out your phones. If you text me at this number, I'll give you our college connect form. This is what I was just talking about a minute ago. This is the form that you can use to start researching the colleges, but you'll need to text me um, or else I won't know. Um, the number that you can text me at is area code five. And then for those of you that are also watching, you can text this number too. Um, 512 571 3804. So again, 512 571 3804. Now, parents, text me your first, your last name, first, last name, your email address. So I know who to send this to. And then the year that your students graduated 2004, 24, 20, you know, 5, 26. So parent first name, parent last name the year of graduation and your email address. And then I'll just email you our College Connect form. You can use that for your college research. And then if you're interested in learning more about our services, you can just put a star, an asterisk, and then somebody from our team will reach out to you um, and you can schedule your discovery call. But we won't reach out to you unless you put a star. So definitely if you wanna know more how our services work, then you can definitely put a star. Okay, so first name, last name, email, year of graduation, and then a star if you wanna learn more. That's the expanded resume. You can do the, download the expanded resume on our website. Now, the fourth piece of writing you'll have for your college application, only got five more minutes left. Fourth piece that you'll have is your short answer questions. Your short answer questions, unlike the main essay where it's around 650 words and it's about self reflection, self discovery, your main essay is around 250 words. Your approach is based off of research. This is where you get to talk about why you're the right fit for that university. This is where you get to really make an argument personalized to that admissions officer, right? 250 words, 150 to 250 each. And these questions are not going to be shared amongst an admissions officer. They are unique to the university you're applying to. So pro tip, do not make this generalized statements. Do not write anything in here that you can say about another university. One of the things that we require for short answer questions, five reasons why you're applying to that university. You read every single reason before applications go live. And if there's something in this list that, that I can say about another university, then it doesn't belong on this outline. You can start your outline now by going home and making a list of five reasons why you're applying to school A, school B, school C, school, school D. You will be so surprised, parents, at how much information your student doesn't know about the colleges they're applying to. That's a big mistake, especially when the school they decide to go to will be part of their life for the rest of their life. And like a home, you could sell it if you pick the wrong school, but this is part of you. And, you know, again, parents, this will be the most expensive gift you give your kid, a college degree. So when you tell your kid, when you ask your kid, why are you applying to UT? And they say, oh, it's a good school. Okay, it's local. A lot of schools are local. It's got a good program, a lot of good programs. Basically what your kid is saying, I don't know why I'm applying to UT. And by the way, when they have to write why they wanna to go to UT, because they will, that's not gonna be a good answer. Good school, it's local, hook up. Not going to work. <laughs> so your short answer questions 
oftentimes it's about the research that you have on that university. When a university says, why do you want to go to college here? You want to talk about your experience as it relates in that intended field of study. You want to highlight your strength and you want to create a connection to the university. Um, you know, you could talk about, again, the faculty members, learning experiences, the unique traditions that that university has, right? You're creating parallels for each other. This is going back to where you're layering your application with, again, information about you. You're using that real estate, 250 words, it's precious. Talk about your accomplishments and why this university has something that you can't find anywhere else. Especially if you're applying to out-of-state colleges, these big, these out-of-state schools, these Ivy schools, Rice, Chapel Hill, MIT, Berkeley, UCLA, they know you're going to probably get admitted into other colleges. You, they know you can stay local and go to UT. Folks getting into UCLA are probably getting into UT. You need to really talk about why that school has something that nobody else has. That takes time. That takes a lot of time. And so you need to make sure that you are ready for that. So your approach for the short answer questions is based off of research. Your short answer questions are just as hard as the main essay if you're going to give the admissions officer excellence. Do not wait until August or September to get started on the writing, right? There's a bottleneck that will happen. Seniors are only getting a few hours of sleep. Nothing's good going to come. Nothing good will come out of, of a main essay you worked on at midnight. And now you have to hurry up and you've got 20 short answer questions you also have to do. And what happens is most people will start writing generic short answer questions and they'll start taking the name off the university and changing the name. And admissions officers can see right through that. So we've talked about the main essay, we've talked about the activity list, we've talked about the expanded resume. We've also talked about the short answer questions. The prompts will not go live for the short answer questions until your college applications open up. But many colleges will start confirming what their writing will be anywhere from now and all the way until the time that the questions open up. Colleges will start advising. We're not changing them with the same ones that we had last year. There's a few staples where they say, you know, tell me about a leadership experience. Tell me about why you want to go into this major. Tell me about why you want to apply to our college or our university. How have you embraced diversity um, is another common topic. These are just some things you can kind of get started on, but you want to get everything else done beforehand. The first three things I talked about so that you have time. And let's not forget, it may be in the middle of August, you've got all this writing done, and now you've decided that your main essay, what you worked on, you actually want to go back and change it. That happens. And you want to make sure you have enough time. You don't want to submit your first and best and final. If you want to make changes to your main essay, you want to go back and have time to do it. We have folks make changes often. It happens. You know, what you worked on and worked on, you realize, yeah, this is, I don't, this isn't sitting with me well. You want to make sure that you have that opportunity to change that. Because once you submit, you can't go back and pull it out. So don't wait. Give yourself as much time as you can for the writing. Any questions so far? I'm going to pass these out in case, um, I don't know if any of you guys have one of these or not, um, but if you want information about us. Um, so we've talked about the writing, we talked about layering your college application. Um, we talked about, um, we didn't talk about letters of recommendation, which can also be go into your college applications. Um, and I do recommend picking recommenders that can really speak to your fit to major and definitely asking them before the end of the junior year and distributing a resume with the brass sheet too as well. Um, so there's that. No other questions? Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. question which is about the it's better beneficial to have a going yes. college. Does that have anything to do with this early decision? That's a good question. And I've got a volunteer over here that's gonna pass these out. So thank you for volunteering. Um, if you want a brochure about us, raise your hand and he'll stop by and give it to you. Um, anybody want information? Yeah, there you go, just raise your hand. Um, she's asking about early decision. All right, so there's actually seven different application deadlines. You have uh, early action one, early action two, restrictive early action, 
rolling admissions, early decision one, early decision two, regular admissions, those are the seven. Parents, when we went to college, you apply the fall, you find out in the spring, it's that easy, right? Early decision is binding, is where you can only apply to one school. <clears throat> um, and so you have to pick one school to apply to. And um, I recommend everyone apply for early action. It's non-binding. You can apply to as many colleges as you want to, but choose wisely with early decision. Um, they tend to be the more selective private colleges. Thank you, what an awesome volunteer. <laughs> um, and it's a strategy that you can use. UT does not have early decision, um, but the schools that do have early decision are often competing amongst each other to protect their yield rate. And I recommend applying early decision to a school that's considered a target for you. What I mean by this is you can bend the odds in your favor of getting a much better acceptance rate by applying early decision because the university knows that they've got you. You're already committed to our school. Um, what most students do is they pick a school that is their extreme reach and they apply ED and they play that card with the wrong school. At extreme reach is still going to be an extreme reach. So pick a school that's a target that has a low acceptance rate and apply early decision for that school to really help you get across the finish line. Colleges will fill an overwhelming number of their incoming class through early decision, meaning that they know that once they admit you, you're coming to their school. And so some schools are filling 40, 50, 60 percent of their incoming class in the early rounds through early decision. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any specific school you're wondering about for ED? No, I just have a okay. uh, student and went to early decision for Rice Club. Yeah, Rice loves early decision too. I think they filled something like 30% of their incoming class. Was it 30 or low 40s? 30 or low 40% of their incoming class was through the early rounds. But you better have cash for early decision because you're also telling them that you don't necessarily need money to go to that school um, and they don't have to give you scholarships. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> you said uh, don't send the, the SAT scores. Uh, how do you send the super score? Do you have to make a search? So you'll log in. So this question is about sending test scores. You can log into your college board account and then you can select the schools that you're going to send your test scores to. And you can pick and choose which schools you're going to send those to. And how do you select the which cases you want to send for the super school? So <coughs> it's hard for me to be specific about your particular circumstance while having more information. But you would look at the, the school that you're applying to and what's going to be considered competitive for that university and what is your what are the different you know um, test scores you've had, and then I would be able to kind of tell you take this one, don't send this one, that sort of thing. It is Sunday morning, you guys. So I might be the very first time any of you guys have actually heard a college consultant speak. And you guys chose to send it with me on a Sunday morning, so thank you. Um, for those of you all that don't know how things work, and one of the most commonly asked questions I get asked is, when is the right time to start preparing for college prep? You're gonna get a different answer based off of who you ask. Most college consultants start formal college planning the junior year. For us in our agency, we start working with incoming freshmen because the colleges that most of the folks are applying to with us are going to be the UT, AM, schools that have a holistic review that are looking at all four years of the academics. So we start working with incoming uh, freshmen so that we can really map out their academic plan, help them with career exploration, college list building, summer planning. Um, we also do SAT, ACT test prep, as all of that will be included. Folks that work with us get 16 hours of group classes for either the SAT or the ACT. That normally starts happening as a rising junior. Um, folks that work with us, so the way things work is you will have a college coach. You will meet with that college coach all the way through May 1st of your senior year and you will be attending strategy sessions. These are like 45 minute hands-on intensives in which your college coach is creating a custom curriculum for you to follow. It's not, we do not have a one size fits all approach. Everybody is truly unique. We are a small agency. We only work with around 25 scholars per application cycle. That's it. Um, because you have to have exclusive um, access to us. 
So you'll attend strategy sessions, we work with you on college list building, uh, academic planning, activity building is huge, making sure that whenever you're applying to the major, that you actually have experience in that major naturally as a prep as well. If you're interested in learning more about that, then you have the phone number that I listed and just send a star and then we'll have somebody reach out to you to, to schedule your discovery call. Otherwise, attend our college prep webinar series. It's free, it's online, you can definitely check that out. Um, and then we'll be sending you the College Connect form, okay? All right, you guys, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, bye-bye.